Hi, software engineers. Even though we're done with the five phases of development, we need to go back and talk about a pretty important topic that is pervasive throughout the entire software lifecycle. A lot of non-functional requirements are things you have to think about with every step of the, of the process. You have to think about them in terms of how do you define a requirement for it? How do you design for it? How do you implement it? How do you test it? How do you keep that non-functional requirement where it needs to be moving forward? Some of these don't require as much post-release um, uh, activity. So something like potentially accessibility. If you make your software um, usable for screen readers, you have to kind of make sure that if you add in new features, they fit that. But there's not a ton more you necessarily have to do. Maybe performance, you might need to do some stuff to make sure that, you know, on newer hardware, it works the right way. But a big one is security. Security is an ongoing part of how you are going to make sure your software is viable into the future. So when you're designing software, you initially start with, well, what are the different paths I can take to come up with a working solution? So go back to our exercise with frameworks, right? You might look at an, a, a solution and say, gosh, I could do this in Ruby on Rails. I could do this in Cake PHP. I could do this in Django. There's reasons to pick each of these. Some of them could be we're more familiar with Ruby. We're more familiar with Python. Maybe it's the environment that you're launching the software in. Maybe there's something about the maintenance environment. And so you would think about those things. What are some other reasons you might choose one as opposed to another? Set up and down. Pause for a moment. Why would you choose one design as opposed to another? What do you think? Did you think about these things? Efficiency. This could be efficiency of the software itself, as in how well it operates. It also could be efficiency of how you build it. Sometimes some languages are just easier to work with. There might be libraries that already exist that do some of the features that you want. So you're more efficient at getting the solution out. Is it flexible? Is it maintainable? Do you know that you're going to be able to keep something running into the future, depending on how you've put it together? There's security. We're going to get to that, obviously. Uh, the usability, the scalability, um, cost of implementation. There's a whole host of reasons why you might choose one design as opposed to another. Now, being an agile project, we didn't, and also because of the nature of the way the class works, we didn't spend a ton of time doing a lot of upfront design. I mean, we kind of did it for you with the model view controller and we gave you some parts of it. Um, but you did make some decisions at some point on which models you were going to have and what the layouts were going to be and the views, the templates, how the data was going to flow. You, you, you did make these decisions, even if we didn't have as much of a formal design process as we could have if it was a longer class. And I don't even mean, you know, not using videos, but I mean, just like a year long class. But did you ever think about security? Did you ever sit there for any moment and say, gosh, what would happen if um, this was a real product and people got access to the data. Did you ever think about what would happen if someone impersonated another user? Why not? Now, the obvious answer here is, Sheriff, this is a class project and you gave us like a month and a half to do it. Okay, you got it. This is another thing where, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to use this post maintenance uh, or post-release, you know, you'll look at this code, you'll look at this code after you leave the class in order to show it to people for demos, for job interviews, and maybe to find some code to put into something else. But yeah, you're not going to maintain it afterwards. I, we, we know this, right? This is part of that suspension of disbelief to make this class work the way it does. So you probably didn't think like, oh, what do I need to do? Other than maybe the stuff with Google login because we made that a point that you had to make login a thing and then you hopefully, hopefully locked down the pages in your application that someone can't just URL hop somewhere into the middle of your application. You haven't done that yet. I want to check. So it's natural for you to not think about it in the context of a class project when the focus of the class is not necessarily software security. But let's think about it. Security, like a non-functional, like many other non-functional requirements, unfortunately tends to get shunted to the end. Um, you see time and time again, 
developers who work on the software and get to the end and they're like, this runs like garbage. Oh my gosh, this is so slow. We need to fine tune it and make it run better. And then they go back and try and fix things. Same thing with, you know, usability. You get to the end or accessibility. You get to the end and you say, oh my gosh, we really should need to put in something in there for people who are colorblind. And go back and fix That's the wrong way of thinking about most non-functional requirements, particularly security. Because if you're not baking in security from the beginning, you're probably going to do it wrong. We know why this doesn't happen. There is very real pressure from average stakeholder. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, oh, your stakeholder is the NSA. Yeah, they care. That's a, that's, they're looking for that, right? But when your average stakeholder is, you know, Grandma Rachel and her, um, her, her painting library app, then, you know, she wants to see where she can flip through her paintings in a very nice way and organize them. Not necessarily you're protecting her from data loss. There's just pressure to have those features in front of the user. We recognize that. So some non-functionals are easier to get across. Like, ooh, look, it's running pretty quick versus not running pretty quick because that's something that the user sees. But security, when done right, should be transparent to the user. The user should not, I mean, they have to log in, but they should not have to worry about things like, well, did you think about what would happen if this data is is grabbed? Would you, did you think about what happened if the data was corrupted in transit or anything like that? So we all agree it's important and we just, we don't pay as much attention to it as we should because of those pressures. But you have to remember, security for a piece of software is not a wrapper. It is not an add-on. It is not a module. It is not something that you get to the end of the, the development life cycle and say, ooh, let me hashtag import security. You know, that's stupid. That does not work. And if you think that I'm going to make my little piece of software and then wrap it in, you know, software bubble wrap to protect it from whatever is out there, you're going to get... It's bad. You have to think about how people can misuse your software, both intentionally and unintentionally, from the beginning to try and make sure that you keep your software as secure as possible. Well, what do we talk about when we say security? I mean, that's a great thing to say. Oh, software secure, that's great. This is one kind of mnemonic for thinking about security. There's a bunch of different versions of these, but they all kind of end up around the same area of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality has to do with what data do you have and who can see it? Okay. Integrity is, is the data correct? And I say is, not are the data correct, because I think of data as an android on Star Trek The Next Generation, and it's very weird for me to use it in the collective plural. So there. Uh, availability. Can you get to the data? Or is it being hit by a denial of service attack or something like that? Or is, this, is, the, is the system down? So these are kind of the three main vectors that we talk about. Each one of them breaks down in its own way. For confidentiality, the main thing we want to think about is authentication versus authorization. Okay? Authentication versus authorization. The difference here is authentication is do we know who the user is and do we know who the server is? So authentication is, it's password stuff. It's, it is the user has some unique token, unique feature, unique something that identifies them as them. And the application, if necessary, has something that identifies it as itself. The simplest version of this is username password. It is a uh, two two token combination that you you have to have both of them as opposed to just one password, you know, a single password, not the app one password, but um, you can see why a single word would be bad. You need to have two pieces in concert in order to log in. Um, but biometrics, so face ID, touch ID, those are all a form of authentication. Those are all, hey, I know who this person is because they gave me something like their thumb or their face that theoretically can't be duplicated. When you log into NetBadge, do you type in your username and password or do you click, click the button that says use a certificate? The certificate is effectively a cryptographic key that is stored on your machine 
that you use in place of a username and password as a skeleton key of sorts. One password or LastPass or any of these password saving utilities is a way of, I'm gonna bundle all of my authentication um, credentials into one library, and then I'm gonna remember just one authentication password that lets me into that key ring, so to speak, which is what it's actually called on a Mac, um, so that you can then get access to everything else. That is the most common way of thinking about authentication. Certificates are another, which by the way, servers have certificates as well. When you go to HTTPS, for any website, that server is actually doing a certificate exchange with your browser to prove that it, it, it is who it says it is based upon um, being um, identified by some third party certificate issuing organization, VeriSign or Internet2 or something. Now, once you're in an application, now what does that individual have the rights to see? That's authorization. When you log into Sys, you can see your data. You can see your financial data, your classes. You are authorized to see that information. When I log into Sys with my normal account, I'm allowed to see all of my advisees schedules. I can see their holds, I can see their home addresses, I can see some basic information, I can see their academic history because that's what I am authorized to see as a faculty member and as their designated advisor. But using that account, I do not have the authorization to see Professor McBurney's advisees. But I went through special training and uh, I got the ability to log in with my super account into SIS, as I like to call it. And when I log into that you know, super account, I have the ability to look up any student at the university and see their transcript. Why? Well, I did that because I'm, I do advising for, you know, some of the new CS courses and sometimes I need to be able to look up other students and see what they've taken. And so I made a case and my manager signed off on it and it went up the chain and other people signed off on it. And I was issued uh, credentials to log in through another way into SIS in order to have this access. So I'm still authenticating as me, Mark Sheriff, but now under those credentials, I am authorized to do other things. So what you're doing with Google login is actually a weird kind of backwards way of doing authentication. It does authentication by authorization. OAuth, that's what the auth stands for, basically says, yes, I verify that this person is this person because I notice they have the ability to read their own data. Sure, why not? But that's, that's what that means. Now, encryption is also a part of confidentiality, but encryption is really overemphasized. I mean, encryption is certainly important. Um, like for instance, you never store a plain text password in a database. You never do that. You always want to store a hash of a password in a database. And then when the password is submitted to your application, you hash the password that comes in and compare the two hashes. That's a much safer way of doing things. But what we care about with encryption is mostly the idea of data in transit versus data at rest. Data at rest means the data is in your database. And so if you have nothing sensitive in the database, like if the passwords are hashed, how are you protecting that database? Is the file itself, the files on the disk, are they encrypted? Are you know, in something like file vault or you know, something that is at the operating system level? Um, how are you protecting that? If someone got access to the machine, could they snip those files up and go do nefarious things with them? Data in transit, however, is the idea of when I am, you know, you log into my application in your browser window, am I doing things like HTTPS to make sure that when the data is being transmitted between the server and your machine, then it is being encrypted so that no one can grab it in the middle. So confidentiality is all about making sure people and machines are who they say they are and ensuring that only the right data is being accessed. That's the authorization point. This can be done through user permissions, through encryption, through a whole bunch of different things. So, okay, what are the possibilities here? What could happen with some of your apps? Remember when we did risk assessment? You can do it here too. So let's just run through these really quick. Let's identify a potential risk. A potential risk of the Study Buddy app is someone could log in as someone else, okay? That is a potential risk. 
What's the likelihood of that happening? Well, okay, it's a student project, so none. But let's let's just back out and say, okay, it's an okay possibility because someone's really trying to get at someone. Um, do we care about this risk? Should we prioritize this risk? Well, what's the possibility of someone logged into someone else for a study buddy app? I mean, we could get super scary here and talk about, you know, instances where people are, you know, joining groups where maybe it's like an, like an ex or someone like that. And it could get awkward. I mean, you could get to some, like, this could be bad. So let's not, let's make sure that this is a higher priority. So how do we, how do we plan for this? What are some contingencies? Well, what if you added two factor authentication to your app as another layer of ensuring that a person is a person when they log into the system. Okay, this is a plan. This is mitigating our overall risk exposure by saying, you know, you really need to use two-factor authentication to make this work. And then we monitor by seeing, uh, do we see someone logging in from a different location? And if they log in from a different location, maybe we flag that. These, this is how you can come up with a risk assessment plan for key risks for your application. So you would sit down and you would think about these scenarios and try and figure out, well, how would we address them along the way? Integrity. We want to make sure the data is always the right data. Um, if, you know, using our same kind of example, if, if someone's able to go in and say, no, the study buddy group doesn't meet it 5 p.m. here, it meets at 9 p.m. somewhere else. You know, how do we make sure the data is correct? We don't want the data modified or corrupted. This, this usually involves protecting the data at the operating system level protecting it in transit, that data in transit, making sure it's encrypted in transit and make sure it's not changed. But also if you have multiple people logging into a system at the same time, it's ensuring that when multiple people are making changes to the same data element, that it's always the latest right version. So um, if you're using a system that has multiple databases, ensuring that they're staying synced in some way, but basically you're trying to make sure the data is always correct and accurate and consistent throughout its life. And by lifetime, I mean as long as that data is valid, because certainly data erodes and you don't necessarily need it. And then availability. This is your good old denial of service attack sort of maneuver. Um, does your system have a single point of failure? Is it running on one dyno on Heroku? I mean, yours is, but you're not really worried about someone theoretically denial of service attacking your school project. Um, but if you have it set up to be running on a system where you have multiple dynos, you have multiple backup databases, um, if hardware fails, that's something you also have to consider as far as availability goes, not just, you know, nefarious acts, misuse cases. Um, so you're doing things like using a fault tolerance system, having hardware like RAID, which where you have multiple hard drives that are backing each other up at the same time, having multiple servers, having backup servers you can switch over to. I mean, a lot of this falls under the concept of DevOps. Now, you know, we're using DevOps in the, in the sense of, the deployment and the development of software is a single circulating entity where you know you 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 push changes to GitHub and then it moves to Travis and the tests are run and then it goes to Heroku and the the the, the circle of life so to speak. Um, but it's also such things as making sure that when you're using a data center that the data center has the right amount of bandwidth, that it has power, that it has air conditioning. I mean, there's a lot of things that do flow into DevOps, the more technical side, the more IT side that have to deal with the availability of your system. So that is a security concern. All right. I hope I've made an argument that it's good to build secure software. <laughs> so how do we do it? Now, this class is not dark art. This class is not intro to cybersecurity. I'm not gonna teach you any of those techniques. So what do we care about from a software engineering perspective? We care about the phases of development. Oh yes, oh yes, we're back to it again. So the point is, what can we do during each phase of development to promote a more secure piece of software? Let's do it. Let's do each of the phases and see where we land. Starting with secure requirements. Modeling um, and eliciting non-functionals is tough. Y'all saw this when you did this with your own project. Uh, the notion of, okay, I want it to be fast. Well, how fast? Okay, every page needs to load at 100 milliseconds. Okay, is that fast enough? 
you know, you start going through all those. When you get to security, it can get weirder too. You know, you talk to a company and they say, well, I want my software secure. Great. What do you mean by that? And if you are the developer, you might not necessarily know that. So this comes down to a problem of communication. It always comes back to communication. It's, it's, it's how do you communicate with the stakeholders what is important? So this is called Square, and I know my head's in the way of part of it, but you can you can see it when you if you pull up the slides. The general idea here is this: this is something that came out of the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon. Great folk do good good software stuff. And the basic idea is: um, here are things you should think about when you are trying to do requirements, and it comes down to things such as um, what are your look at step two. You know what are the assets and security goals. What are you actually trying to protect? This is the conversation you need to have. Do you care about protecting what people's orders are? Or do you care about protecting what people's username, um, name, address? Do you care about protecting that? Do you, what do you care about? If you don't need to protect your, you know, how many of a certain video game you have in stock or a certain television you have in stock, if you don't, if that's public information anyway, maybe you're not spending a lot of time to make sure that database is encrypted or whatever you might think about but you 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 say no i need to protect user data so actually backing up to step one this is what agreeing on definitions the the developers and the or the requirements elicitation team and the stakeholders need to agree this is what's important and this is how we're going to protect it and this is what we're going to call it so you identify those assets you perform the risk assessments just like we just did you know what is the problem if someone gets access to the user data how big not only is it a big issue for the system, how big an issue is it for the company from a, from a PR perspective? That's something you have to consider as well. Categorize those requirements, prioritize them, go through the normal requirements process. But something like this gives you a, a, a framework of saying, okay, during requirements, how do we identify what are the critical security needs so that we make sure we're focusing on them from the very beginning? You have to use Square. No, you don't have to use Square. This is just an example to talk about that idea. In specifications, when we're converting those requirements to something that's actionable by the developers, we need to give them something that they need to build. Like you need to say, we need to use this particular library for doing login authentication. We need to use this type of library for encryption, or these are the standards we're going to use when we're transmitting data from point A to point B. The SRS documentation um, that we see with plan driven actually has security as an aspect of the document that you fill out. And it talks about how you model data, how you, how you format and define security concerns. So there's actually some guiding stuff in plan driven for how you write up security. Not as much in agile. That doesn't mean you can't do it. And you certainly you know, can and should, but let, let's, let's step back for a second. Let's talk about the polar chart. So in the polar chart, Remember, we have the different axes for talking about um, uh, criticality. Well, if something has, you know, if, it, if it's Grandma Rachel's painting database, the criticality is pretty low. So if the criticality is low, we might not need to model security requirements quite as much because there's not as much security need. But as things become more and more mission critical, or if something goes wrong, <clears throat> repercussions are even greater, then there's a higher likelihood you're using plan driven already. So, so it's, it, it's, it's a correlation, not causation sort of thing. It turns out that when you have something that has higher security requirements, there's probably other aspects of the system that already are going to lead you down the path of doing more plan driven. But again, that doesn't mean you cannot do this with agile. You absolutely can do this with agile. Uh, you, it just looks slightly more, it just looks a little bit different, but you're still thinking about the same thing. Now, design. Um, you look at a framework and you think about, well, this framework is meant for, it's, it's rock steady, um, it, it's open source, people have looked at it for security flaws, so you feel more comfortable starting with that as a base. And then you start making decisions on top of that. Um, what data do we want to make available in this particular part of the application? You build an application so that there is one database user for the application and it's not using the super user account. It's using uh, a limited user account. So when I log in to this application as a student, 
then I can only read student readable tables. But when I log into an application as a faculty member, then I can read student tables and faculty tables. Those are kind of design level choices that help emphasize security. And this is beyond the scope of this course, but this is more around the idea of when you design an aspect of the system, you want to design for what is needed at that time, like in that feature and not send everything. You don't want to over like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do a select all from the entire table of the database in order to have, no matter what I need in this fee, in this form, I'll always have access to it. That's just poor design. Not only is that going to be a problem for performance because you're sending more stuff, um, then if there is some sort of security leak that you're missing, then all that data is being passed. And so basically you want to limit the data that you have, that you access at any given point in the application to just what's needed. Uh, and that's, that alone can, can cover a lot of problems. Um, there's also things such as, you know, um, SQL injection attacks, making sure that you are building software with, uh, where you're not just combining SQL commands. Um, but you're using an MVC framework, so you don't necessarily see this. So this is something you just have to kind of think about. We're actually going to do some of this um, as part of the, the guided practice, but we'll come to that. Implementation. Again, go see dark arts. <laughs> but also during the, the implementation process, things like code reviews, that's a good thing. Having other people look at your code to say, hey, is this working? Is this good? Is this bad? Is this going to do what I want it to do? Is this... Did I mess up? Having other people look at it. That's part of implementation. Have others weigh in. Is there a design pattern? Is there a known security design pattern for something you are trying to build? If there is, maybe you should go look at it. Um, security experts are people that you could bring in during the implementation process as a part of your code inspection, code review process. And you know they could come in and look at the, the code base. They could look at your development practice. They could look at your requirements, your design documents. Um, they could look at how the system's being deployed. This is a thing. You, know, you, you hire a specialty company to come in and kind of audit your security processes. And yeah, this is a great way for, for your team to feel better about what you're doing, which leads right into the security testing. You're probably writing your own good test cases, hopefully, for your software, but maybe you need some security experts to come in and try and do some, like, friendly security testing or penetration testing and try and break the software. There are tons of organizations out there, some good, some bad, um, that their, their role is to come in as play as nefarious third party and we're going to try to break your system and then we're going to give you a report on what we found. And they'll do things like threat modeling, they'll do stress testing on the software, they'll do load testing, they'll try and you know, do all the common attacks. They'll, they'll check to see what sort of uh, patches you're running. Some of this is automated, by the way. There are automated tools you can point towards a Django app and say, how does this look? And that's, that's good. That's a good first step, but you shouldn't just trust that as the end all be all. So um, getting expert uh, opinion, good thing. So I used the term penetration testing a minute ago. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. When you're testing a system from the outside, like as a user, and you're trying to find and exploit any vulnerability. So this could be something like looking at coming around from, you have an extra port open in the network, or there's an OS patch that you're missing, or um, there's something that is not, is part of the application perhaps, but also could be part of just the environment the application is running in. Can you get into the application in a certain way? For web applications, cross-site scripting attacks, SQL injection attacks, you, you start running these things to try and figure out if you can get in. Now, a problem with penetration testing is that you kind of have to have a working beta version of the system for a lot of it. I mean, not, I mean, it depends on the software, always does. But, you know, at the end, if you're trying this type of penetration testing and you come back with a negative result, like, no, nope, couldn't get in. Well, it also could mean you didn't test hard enough. So Security is something you have to be constantly vigilant about. You have to constantly see what new threats are coming up, what new exploits are coming up, and always are, 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 are paying attention to, to how things change, which is maintenance. Secure software doesn't stay secure forever. Software degrades. 
Bugs are found in your underlying packages. Things are deprecated. Uh, new attacks are found. New ways of attacking are found. Old defects that you didn't even know were there are found. You have to audit your systems constantly to make sure they're up to date. So what do we mean by auditing? Well, here's an example. So uh, Berkeley has this application security testing process. So the goal is assess an, an, if an application meets security standards. So here's the Berkeley application security testing program. And, and what this basically is, is, hey, if you're using our, if you are, if you're looking at data here at Berkeley, then you need to follow some certain rules. So let's go to the details of, and so here are the phases, some pre-engagement interactions, take some time, they do threat modeling, they do the actual testing over two to three re weeks, generate a report. And so here are the things they, they, they do, they try for injection, they do try for cross-site scripting. Um, all of the things that you hope, they uh, give you back a, a risk rating for everything that's happened, and then they grade the application. Now they're grading this based upon what type of data is being accessed. So. Okay, this is the new version, great. So these are the different protection levels of data. And so this goes back to what you do during the requirements phase, figuring out, well, how important is some stuff? How do I need to manage it? So the highest level of protection, P4 here, includes things like, oh, social security number, driver's license, financial account, credit card numbers, HIPAA information. Yeah, like the serious stuff, right? So we scroll down, what's protection level three? Moderate, okay, PII. So this would be like name and stuff. Some degree, well, it does not include public directory information. Security camera recordings, building entry records, uh, animal research projects. Okay, let's move down another. Protection two, low. Information need intended for release only and need no basis, including personal information. So data protected by grants, routine email and business recordings, exams, questions and answers. Oh, look, it, it's under a category. Um, all the way down to minimal protection, public facing informational websites, public event calendars, hours of operation, parking regulations, things that you would certainly hope would be available. So they go through here and say, well, where is all this data available? How is it available? How can people get access to it? It's all part of the, the, the process, right? So for, for any given application, so imagine that at UVA, Collab is something that would have to go through such a process. So every year, Collab gets has to go to go to the this testing program, and they look at the program. They look at Collab and they say, "Okay, what data does Collab manage? Well, it has usernames, what has computing IDs, has names, but it doesn't have your financial information, and it doesn't have medical information. It doesn't have social security numbers. Um, it doesn't even have your sys ID number, which is really." hard to sometimes, but so you could look at this and say, okay, maybe some of the data is that P3 level or P2 level. UVA has different categorizations. This is just a nice page for showing it. And so you look at this and then you say, okay, well, um, what are some potential problems? What happens if someone logs into collab with some other students information? How do you protect that? How do you prevent that? Do the actual testing. And so you do this audit, do this audit every year. And so you do this audit every year to try and make sure that uh, everything is meeting the standards it needs to meet and things are all hunky-dory, fun, fun and good. So uh, yeah, it's a specific process for assessing your system. Uh, it's kind of like a software inspection process, but you know, you're training the, 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 the users, the, the, the app owner uh, needs to be trained on how this process works and they understand the potential threats have another team do the testing and then you report on it and you go and you fix all the problem constant vigilance is necessary to make sure your software stays safe um so any organization that handles sensitive, sensitive data has as a process to assess the security annually starts with the stakeholders done testing independently based on doc document approaches and addresses security throughout the life cycle so Security has to be something that you think about through requirements, design, implementation, testing, and through maintenance to make sure that at the end of the day, you do have something that is robust against potential misuse attack. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't talk about many of the, the techniques that you would use during development. This is more just how important it is to think about this, these concepts, the confidentiality, integrity, 
uh, availability? How are you providing those features to users, to stakeholders, while making sure that your product does what it needs to do and also you're, you're keeping it up as you go along? So that's the gist of how of engineering software security. Um, I highly encourage you to take some of the security classes that we have, like Intro to Cyber or Dark Arts. Um, the takeaway here, it's a non-functional requirement that you have to think about from day one. So hope that helps. Hope the jump cuts in this video weren't too bad. I had some problems with my browser windows, but that's what happens sometimes. Have a good one. See you next time. Bye.